Since this is my first time to be here since I was in the hospital and being a bit ill, I want to thank everybody for the prayers, for the cards, and for asking about things. It's always good to know, as Brother Buddy prayed a while ago, to know that brethren are thinking about you, and we certainly do miss being able to assemble and added all of this stuff going on with COVID-19 and so forth. It just adds to the importance of not taking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is that much more importantly. As the writer of Ecclesiastes said, there is nothing new under the sun. The problems we face are the problems others down through the ages have faced. It may be that because of modern advancements, we're able in a lot of ways to handle things better when it comes to physical things. But those matters of the mind or the heart, such as hate, injustice, ignorance, inequality, selfishness, covetousness, jealousy, sinful bigotry, lying, outright denial of the existence of God or atheism, and all such things have plagued mankind almost from the beginning, ever since sin entered the world. The remedy for the corruption that is in the world in every culture and at every level of society at any time is found only in Jesus Christ of Nazareth and his gospel, God's power to save man from sin. I suggest that we should think often about John 14, 15 and our Lord's statement there that I am the way, the truth, and the life and that no man cometh unto the Father but by me. Thus, the Word of God can properly deal with all the issues men face at any time on this earth, such as Paul's writing in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, as to the value and completeness of the Scriptures when it comes to handling spiritual and moral matters, and above all, in reconciling men to God through obedience to the gospel. We who wear the name of Christ, Christian, as it's defined and used in the New Testament, must never forget this. Now you will remember that Paul the Apostle was taken by the philosophers of Athens to the Areopagus for the purpose of addressing the people about the claims of Christianity. The passage is Acts chapter 17, verses 22 through 28. That would be the text for the lesson of this morning. It reads this way as Luke, by inspiration, recorded it. Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you're too superstitious. In other words, you're a very religious bunch of people. For I passed by and beheld your devotions. I found an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship. Him declare I unto you, God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, <coughs> dwelleth not in temples made with hands, neither is worshipped with men's hands, as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things, and hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth. Now you can drive a pig down there because we're coming back to that in a moment and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation, that they should seek the Lord, if haply they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, 
as certain also of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. We could say a lot about Athens. It had been the seat of great learning for hundreds of years. Athens is an example also, a prime example of the Gentiles as they're described in Romans chapter 1 by the Apostle Paul. They are not guided by Old Testament morality, much less New Testament morality. They are idolatrous people and they follow human philosophies. They had abandoned their creator for gods of their own making. And those gods reflected their own fleshly desires. However, in Athens, the Apostle Paul points them back to the beginning. Think about that for a moment. If you're going to teach people, take them where they are and point them back to the beginning as the Bible declares that beginning. So he declared to them that every nation, every tribe and tongue had a common beginning, and that was God. In this sermon, we want to study the importance and significance of that truth where I said you need to drive a pig down a while ago in our reading from one blood, all nations. From one blood, all nations. He hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth. As it has ever been the case, the world is full of all kinds of people. People who look differently, who think differently, who talk differently. The world is composed of various nations, ethnicities, cultures, and languages. Now, it's almost second nature, I'll put it that way, to us. For us to tend to group people together based upon their physical, perhaps their cultural features, maybe adding to that language that they have in common. Now, because of this way of thinking, if we're not ever so careful, we judge and treat people differently based upon those differences. The history of the world is filled with racial and ethnic strife. One group falsely believing itself to be superior to another. World War II with the Nazis that was one of their key positions, that they were supermen, and there were others who were untermenschen, that is, well, be nice about it, lower people and not really people. We fought all kinds of wars then, even to modern times, over this evil philosophy that one group is superior to another on the basis of what I've just said as to how we look at people and how we size them up. The Greeks of Athens viewed themselves as superior to other people because of their history of intellectual progress and just about any other way. The ones who really looked at them as less than them, and you might guess, would be the Romans. The Romans thought the Greeks there were for their use. <laughs> but that's the way people are. When Paul was in Athens, he was given then the opportunity to tell them about the one true God. Paul began by telling them that the true God of heaven, and watch how he does it, transcended any temple made with hands 
and that he dwelt in and over creation and was the creator of all things who himself was eternal and not created. He reduces humans or humanity composed of nations and tribes and various ethnicities and all kinds of backgrounds to one common beginning. Acts 17, verse 25 and 26, notice. Seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things and hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth. The apostle affirms that all of mankind, all humans, are the creation of God. Now let's investigate a little more deeply than sometimes we do the phrase of one blood. Actually, it means of one man. In other words, he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth. Or, to put it another way, from one man, he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out boundaries or appointed times in history various other things. That's the reason that when you see Nebuchadnezzar's dream and Daniel's interpretation of it, it fit right into time and space that was at that time future. But nevertheless, it was in history, or would be history. And it was marked out for such and such to be. And thus, as we may have occasion to refer to it again, in Galatians 4.4, 4, in the fullness of time God sent forth His Son. Those things are marked out. So it covers more than just how he made this physical world for us to live in with our atmosphere and gravity, et cetera, et cetera. All these things are under the absolute control of God. All humanity then had, has a common beginning. Adam, the first man. The Bible declares that in the beginning God created the first human in his own image, Genesis 2, 7. And that doesn't mean physical. I think all of us here know that. It means in the moral likeness of God. From Adam, God created the woman, the womb man, his suitable help and companion for life, Genesis 2, 21 and 22. So every human can trace himself or herself back to Adam and Eve. In Genesis 3.20, it stated that Eve is the mother of all living. Now, we won't go into all the matters of the genetics that are involved in this. I think that's quite evident. We talked about it earlier. But that does comment more fully on what we're talking about as far as man, even though physically there are all kinds of differences and culturally there are too in languages. Adam and Eve committed sin and there's where the problem started and they lost their state in the Garden of Eden in that paradise. Now, time goes on and with the passing of time their descendants become increasingly sinful to the point that God destroyed mankind with the flood of Noah's day, except for Noah and Noah's family, Genesis chapter 6. Thus, we see that humans started over through Noah's family. Well, somebody might say, if that's the case, why are there so many physical differences in the human family? Well, I've touched on that just a little, haven't I? concerning matters of genetics. I don't know how anybody can be involved in the breeding of animals and not get an idea of just how there are so many different kind of looks among people. People can engineer genetics to the point of getting a new breed of something. 
And I ought to tell them different skin colors, different physical traits, all the diversity extent among humans that are in the world today or ever have been. Then in Genesis 11, the Bible records that when mankind came to a place later named Babel, the people rebelled against God because remember God had said, you scatter throughout the earth, replenish it. And they said, we'll stay here. So they refused to migrate throughout the world as God told them to. And God intervened and scattered them by confounding their language. Thus they couldn't communicate. Now as a consequence, mankind then dispersed throughout the earth and settled apart one another with those they could communicate with. I don't know because the Bible silent on it. Just how much of that happened as far as how many languages there were. You know, God could have said, well, you're going to speak a certain language, and the people that speak that language all have a certain physical characteristic. Nothing in the Bible that would oppose that. So I don't know how it happened. I don't have to know. Because he was interested in getting them apart. When you can't communicate, you're pretty much apart. Now, as the years passed, people increased. Differences continued to surface, physical and otherwise becoming more genetically isolated as well as geographically and environmentally separated until they developed more distinct physical characteristics uh, for various reasons, such as various skin colors, pigmentation. Over the centuries, nations and kingdoms and empires arose. Within those things, cultures developed so that humans became different not only physically but culturally but you know that doesn't rule out the fact that they all had a common beginning no one knows what Adam and Eve looked like physically nobody does you can guess but it would just be a guess and you might say I got an educated guess it's still just a guess. Nobody knows. No ethnicity, no skin color can claim Adam and Eve. Just can't do it. The Bible simply makes the point that they were made in God's image. Let that sink in. There's the focus of inspiration. Did you get that? Man made in the image of God is where God focuses. You ever notice how man gets it always backwards? We focus on outward appearance. Even in God selecting David King, he made it clear, I'm not looking at a man to be king and evaluating him as to whether he should or shouldn't be on the basis of the way men consider who's a good one for a king. For God looks on the heart. Well, the heart is the inward man made in the image of God. So the Bible simply makes the point that they were made in God's image. They were created living souls. And all of mankind came from them. So it is that the inspired apostle Paul said that God made from one blood or one man all nations of the earth and appointed them times and places when and where they would live throughout history Acts 1726 having created this terrestrial ball as a place for them to live therefore in creation we have a common beginning and it focuses on the inward man and not on the outward appearance Right now, if you were told, I'll give you $1 billion. If you will give me your depiction of what Adam looked like physically, there'd be no way in the world that you could claim the billion dollars because nobody knows. It would be just your subjective view. So mankind was spread over the earth. Nations came into existence, and through all of this development, 
God was unfolding his plan to redeem the human race from sin. Now, when we start focusing on things in that way, it's going to give us a different perspective of how we deal with people. Involving all of this is then in history the unfolding of the scheme of redemption. And in doing that, he has a messianic promise and a messianic family and a messianic nation that through Abraham renewed again to Isaac and Jacob, whose name he changed to Israel. And through the descendants of Israel, there is developed then a literal physical nation. Now, why did God do things this way? Well, when I asked that question, I almost chuckled to myself because who am I to determine why God does anything anyway? Why did he even create man? Why did he create man and put him in a situation like this? Why did he create man and make it possible for him to sin? And then when all have sinned and come through the glory of God, he makes a way through his great favor that man doesn't deserve by the gospel system of salvation to be saved. Somebody says, couldn't he have done it another way? Well, that's not the point. You might as well say, well, I wish I'm not here. I wasn't here. But you are. And dealing with the reality, you've got to deal with you as you are. So why did God choose them, the Jews, to the exclusion of other nations? Well, he could have chosen somebody else. He even reasons with them when they engage in sin. And when they get so puffed up and being so proud in the Old Testament, he'll say, I took you as a baby that was born thrown in the ditch and worthless, and I made you what you are. You think you're any better than anybody else? Which basically is saying, I could have done that with anybody, and he could. In fact, he tells Moses at one time when Israel's sinning, get out of the way, I'll destroy them and start all over. But this is the way he did it. If you had done it some other way, I'm sure somebody would have been there saying, couldn't you have done it another way? He chose Abraham, promising him that he would be the one out of whom he would make a nation and thereby bless the world through that nation. And God chose the nation of Israel because his plan in time involved bringing his only begotten son to the world, John 3, 16, to redeem mankind. Galatians 4, 4, I've already referred to it. In the fullness of time, God sent forth His Son, made of a woman. No man involved in the conception of Jesus Christ. Abraham was not chosen because of the color of his skin. Tell me what color Abraham's skin was. He wasn't chosen because he was a wealthy man, though he was. Or because he lived at a certain time don't you know why he was chosen Abraham is the father of what of the faithful he's a prime example of faithful obedient service to God that's why he was chosen and when his faith was pulled to the ultimate test take thy son thy son whom thou lovest and offer him a burnt offering Abraham began to make preparations to do just that. So he would not withhold his son, the son of promise, the only son he and Sarah had from God. And thus he's written and recorded for us to show us what it is to be faithful to Jesus Christ under the law of Christ. From Abraham through Isaac and Jacob, God kept his promises to Abraham originally. He created the nation of Israel and his plan was that the Jews would be the avenue to blessing to all the world. They kept God's name alive in the world. They were to serve as a light to the rest of the world. To bring redemption not only to themselves but to the rest of the world through Jesus Christ who would be born of their number. Once Jesus came and offered himself as a sacrifice for sin, then their reason for existing, their purpose for an ethnic nation was fulfilled. 
And the door of salvation was then open to people of every nation, of every tongue, of every tribe, of every ethnicity. Now listen to Paul as he wrote to the church in Ephesus with what we've said in mind. To those brethren in Asia, in the city of Ephesus, Paul penned in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 14 through 16, speaking of the Christ, for he is our peace. He hath made both one and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity. Enmity means hate. Even the law of commandments contained in ordinances. For to make in himself of two one new man, so making peace. And that he might reconcile both, that's Jew and Gentile, unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity or hate thereby. Now we can talk about how great America is and it has been. We can talk about all the various things that have gone before and how we've had things so much better. But America needs saving just like any other people. With Christ having come, and the purpose of the Mosaic law fulfilled. What did God do? Well, he erased any national or ethnic distinction between the peoples of the earth. So Paul could say to the churches of Galatia in Galatians 3, 27 and 28, For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Listen. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free, slave or free. There is neither male or female. For ye are all one in Christ Jesus. Now he's not saying that he's done away with the sexes. It's obvious from other statements in the Bible all the way through that the role you have as a male and the role you have as a female are regulated by the Word of God and the perfect law of liberty. What he's saying is that those things have no bearing on your salvation. Everybody's saved by the same gospel, whether you're a slave or a free man, or whether you're a female or a male. None of that makes any difference when it comes to being forgiven of your sins and how you're forgiven. So to Cornelius, his uh, family, and the Jews accompanying the Apostle Peter, the Apostle declared, Of a truth, I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. But in every nation, he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. Red and yellow, black and white. They are precious in His sight. Why? Because the focus is on the soul. The focus is on the blood shed for the remission of sins. When you become a new creature in Christ, rising from the watery grave of baptism, physically, except for being wet, you look the same way as you did when you went in. But you don't. Inwardly. God says you are a new creature in Christ. Old things have passed away. All things are become new. Is that helping us understand how we should view people and especially our brothers and sisters in the Lord? It should be. In this world, God only distinguishes between two groups of people. Only two groups. Those who are saved by the gospel through an obedient faith and are faithful in the Lord's church to which he adds everyone whose sins he remits as they're baptized for the remission of sins. And those who are lost because they yet remain in their sins. Or members of the church who apostatize or get caught up in a trespass they won't repent of. 
The point is, you're either saved or you're lost. Now, the Bible's clear that the dust, by God's own mouth, or the body, is going to return to the dust from which it made. it's made. So all these comments, these things having to do with salvation, must have to do with that which is eternal. Even the body that is promised to those who die in the faith, according to 1 Corinthians 15, is a body fitted for eternity, as John said. We don't know what we'll be like, but we will be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Brethren, the Bible focuses on the spiritual. Now, it involves our dealings one with another in the flesh. That's rather obvious. When I decided to obey the gospel, they didn't baptize my spirit. They baptized my body in which my spirit dwelt. God doesn't see you or me as this color or that color or this ethnicity or that ethnicity or this nation or nationality or another. This race or that race. He sees all of us as lost or saved and if lost in need of the gospel, the one singular gospel revealed only on the pages of the New Testament. Brethren, whatever we do as members of the church, to which the Lord added us, when we're on the heart, we obey the gospel. Whatever we do in our dealings one with another, as brothers and sisters in Christ, or all of our neighbors, or wherever it may be, we don't need to get to the point to where we let their physical appearance, their ethnicity, and their language cause us to make judgments about them that God would not make. And my Bible still says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. Whosoever believeth in Him should not perish and have everlasting life. God is not slack concerning His promise. Some men count slackness. But is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. 2 Peter 3, verses 8 and 9. He sees us all as sinners in need of salvation or He sees us as His faithful children on the way to glory. I want to close with this last thought written to Christians. They were still having some problems with this business of Gentiles and Jews and these are Jewish Christians. In James chapter 2 verses 8 and 9 He tells them how to remedy this problem he says, if ye fulfill the royal law, according to the scripture, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Ye do well. Who, who, who here doesn't want to do well? But if ye have respect to persons, ye commit sin and are convinced of the law as transgressors. The royal law and the law of Jesus Christ himself teaches every one of us as his people to love our neighbor. Oh, but somebody says, who's my neighbor? Well, that question was asked of Jesus a long time ago. Who's my neighbor? And he answered it in Luke chapter 10 with the account of the Good Samaritan. You know that the Jews despised, let's put it mildly, the Samaritans. Yet here a Jew is robbed, beaten, naked, left for dead in the ditch. But here comes one who should be exemplary of practicing the law of Moses. In fact, who? A priest and a Levite. And they see the man in the ditch and they go by on the other side of the road and they pay no attention to him at all. But here comes this lowly Samaritan who if he'd thought like a lot of folks would have said, you got just what you deserve. I'm going on my way. But he didn't, did he? And when he finishes all that the Samaritan did to take care of the man, here's how Jesus ended that. I would love to have seen the faces of those people when he asked them, which now of these three thinkest thou 
was neighbor unto him that fell among thieves. All they could say was, he who showed him mercy. Thought about that some. You know, they wouldn't say the Samaritan. You ever notice that? They wouldn't say the Samaritan. All they could say was, he showed him mercy. Of course, if I was, you know, knowing me, I'd say, yeah, and who is that? <laughs> Wasn't you, was it? But he knew already in their minds they were convicted of the whole thing. There wasn't any use of doing any more than that. Who's my neighbor? The person that needs my mercy and my help. Whether it's teaching them the gospel or as you have opportunity to do good to all men, especially those household of faith, Galatians 16. Now I close the lesson by pointing out that the whole emphasis of this lesson is viewing humans as God views them, either lost or saved, and then treating people who need help, who need mercy, however form it's going to take in supplying their needs, as we do in the Good Samaritan account. We look throughout this nation and we see people doing everything under the sun to hurt other people. Sometimes it's worse than others, and these are one of those times. I don't know where it's going to end. I know things are in a strain. But let me say this. It's not the first time they've been in a strain, and it won't be the last. And I'm telling you, to use the words of the Hebrews writer, it could get a whole lot worse than it is now. But whatever the situation is, it will not change God's truth as to how we became Christians, what we're to be as Christians, and how we're to view one another, whether we're in the church or out of it, and our duty to one another and to mankind. If you're not a child of God this morning, we beg of you to believe that Christ is the Son of God. Repent of your sins, confess your faith in Him, and be baptized for the remission of your sins. As a child of God, if you have let things slip, if you have sinned, whatever way it is you've done so, God knows and you know. Humble yourself and repent of those sins and pray to God and we'll pray with you if you need to. And God has promised to hear and forgive. I love to end sermons because now I can always put an invitation. For when the hand of redemption is withdrawn and this world is no more, there will be no more invitations from God to those lost in sin for them to come home. So today is the day of salvation, and now is the accepted time. If you need to come to Christ, please come while we stand and sing.